So the topic is maximum entropy random looping graphs. And well, this is uh, taken a problem of generating looping graphs. That this is certainly not the only approach, uh, but is the one I've been looking at. And I think it shows some interesting results and more interesting problems. I think. Uh, so first, what do I mean by loopy? Well, it's basically this, like uh, not tree-like. And there are many options for this. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the case where the graphs are sparse. That means there's a, uh, a number of links that's proportional to the system size. Uh, so the main question is why am I interested in them? Well, first, because real networks uh, we observe are usually loopy. So that's, uh, for example, biological network or social network or networks in particle physics, and by this I mean uh, like a, a lattice in a solid or in condensed matter, and they are never in this shape. But if you look at the literature, most of the things that are solved are for networks uh, that are trillion. The other thing that's important is that usually when you have applications, if for example, a social network, you would like to test and say, well, the features I observed here, are they normal in networks or is this anomalous? And to do that test, basically you need a null model, which means you want some sort of random network that preserves some of the features but not all of them. Um, so then, what will I be talking about when I mean networks? I will be only talking of uh, simple, non-directed networks that I will represent by its adjacency matrix, which is the uh, a big matrix of ones and zeros, symmetric. And sparse, I just mean the, the number of non-zero entries is of order n. Okay, so what are the, like some sort of, let's say, usual or traditional random graph models? Uh, the first one is uh, the Erdos Rayleigh, where basically you put a one or a zero independently. So each edge is added independently. And I chose this scaling C over N just to enforce this uh, finite connectivity. Another uh, famous one is the configuration model where you basically restrict the sum of each row or column to a finite value. And it's basically uniform. As long as uh, this thing is, not, is one, then, it, uh, then the graph is valid. And if it doesn't fulfill this constraint, then you don't observe that graph. Uh, there are also other type of uh, models like this where you can also add uh, degree-degree correlations or stuff like this. But in all of those cases, the graphs will be tree-like. And why is this important? I took this very nice uh, table from uh, Bukmai Newman. Here's, so this is a lot of networks, real networks. And what we have here is the system size. And this is the average degree which is like the average of this sum over the row. And here in this one, we have the clustering, which is uh, some, somehow like the, a measure of the number of triangles around each node. And here it's compared with a graph generated like this, with putting each edge independently, with the same expected uh, connectivity. But you can see that clearly, the clustering here is, uh, is several orders of magnitude below. Which means that this, I mean, we could say, okay, this is anomalous, but that's not really what we want. We want a random graph that presents similar values for clustering, and then we can compare it. Otherwise, this means that if we try to use, to use this as a model for our networks, there will, like, we will always see them as very anomalous. So then the, the, question, the natural question is, okay, how do we push this forward? Okay. So let's say a very, like what you would naively do is, okay, I will choose this maximum entropy thing. And here, the probability of a graph is proportional to the exponential of the number of links. And, sorry, this should be a T or a three. Uh, it's just the number of triangles in the graph. Right? And you would like, this is a basic, uh, simple maximum entropy setting. 
and you want to fix the number of links and the number of triangles. So this, uh, if you familiar with maximum entropy ensembles, it would be like the natural thing to do. And then you just have to calculate this, right? Uh, what's the problem with this? That you can actually, you cannot scale it in a way that you get graphs that you like. For example, uh, with this scaling, you can prove that asymptotically you only get graphs that are behave like the ER one, but with a probability given by this graph. Uh, and you see, like this is not scaling as one over n, which means there are dense graphs. And if you try to scale it in such a way that you do not get a dense graph, then you lose all the loops again. So there's really no way for you to get uh, a nice graph. Basically, either you get the same ER, or if you try to boost the, the loops, you get something like the full the fully connected graph having probability almost one, which for a model of a real network is uh, is useless because this is not the thing we started with. So then, what's the other option? Clearly, what's happening is that this uh, this state, this fully connected state, has so many triangles that it dominates the metric. Uh, so then what can we do? We can restart our maximum entropy approach, but now we impose a hard degree constraint. So it's a mix. So we have a soft constraint on the number of triangles, that is, we ask for our ensemble to have a T star and average triangle, but we ask for each degree we fixed. Yeah? Uh, on the slide before, uh, the probability, like the condensation probability, you are not constraining code, so on average, the, the the degree sequence, you're just constraining global measures, right? Yeah, no, this is just, this result is just for, uh, okay. yeah, for the expected number. Of the that method. makes sense, because you are not telling yeah. the ensemble that you should have uh, even soft constrained uh, degree sequence. I mean, I would be interested in seeing the, the result with a constraint also on the, on the degree se sequence even soft, not, not hard. Hmm. I wouldn't expect yeah. a condensation in that yeah. scenario. I don't know, I haven't looked at that particular problem. The thing is, this graph has so many triangles that I think it could also just uh, dominate, basically. But yeah, I, I haven't really looked at it. But here, the natural question would be, okay, what happens if I like fix this with a hard constraint, right? Uh, so then we get this sort of like mix. So then what's like our goal? It's basically, first, uh, write down a formula with respect to our parameter for the expected number of triangles, uh, which will give something like this. So this is normalized. And also, the other thing is, if we want this to be useful, let's say, for applications, we also need a, a way of sampling these graphs numerically to generate them. Um, and I think this is also a really interesting problem, so I'll, I'll start by discussing that one first. Uh, so how would you do this normally? You would start with a Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, uh, which means you want to build some sort of dynamical process that's like going from graph to graph with a transition probability uh, that obeys like detailed balance with this material, basically. Uh, the tricky thing if you have done this with graphs, is that here you want to preserve the degree constraint. So how do you do that? Basically, you do these edge drops. So how will the dynamics will work? You choose two edges at random, and then you flip them. Right. So first, you have to choose this pair of edges at random. The second thing you need to do is you need to either accept or reject or reject that flip. And well, and the probability, you might like. I think everyone would like naively expect just to be this part, like the, the change in uh, your energy. But what's really interesting is that here you actually, you also need to take into account like some sort of entropic term, which uh, in the literature I've seen, it's, it's rarely taken into account. And why is this important? Because this is reflecting the fact that when you are moving through the graph space, there are less or more uh, number of possible flips uh, than in your original uh, setting. So you also have to take this into account in order to have the correct uh, like sample. Oh. 
Okay. Now, so well, first, for the rest of the talk, I will just now be concerned with the regular graphs because this is the only one that you can sort of work yourself analytically with. And you'll just some sort of advertisement. If you're more interested in this sort of approach to generating random graphs, you should check out uh, the book by uh, my supervisor, Tom Kuden, Generating Random Networking Graphs. And it goes really into a very nice detail and very well explained. Okay. So if you, if you start your simulation like that, this is what you will observe, right? Like for a small value of alpha, so you'll see the number of triangles increase and sort of like clear break here, a larger. And then if you make it really large, you'll see that it just goes straight to the maximum. And okay, so now we wish to understand this. So, well, for me the, okay. Okay, so now, I'm sorry. Before we say, okay, can we now get a prediction for that? So the path of like a statistical physicist will be okay. I need to calculate this uh, partition function and then just take the derivative, right? Uh, and just for the rest, you know, the number of triangles in a graph, it's also a six of the trace of the third power of the adjacent symmetry. So I just take this as standard. So I will just change my language into this. Right? Uh, so now, this is actually a really complicated to calculate. You see, in most of, like, if you look into this sort of like spin systems, you usually rely on the fact that you can sort of factor it, factorize this. Okay. Here the problem is that this is the trace and you cannot basically match with this. Like even if you use this as some sort of integral representation here, you can actually, you cannot work yourself around this. Which makes it really complicated, basically. Uh, so complicated that so far I have not found any like reliable way of doing it exactly, except for the case of connectivity equal to two. Which is kind of, like, if you think about it, it's kind of trivial because it's just large graphs that are rings, right? But anyway, if this is the only thing you can do exactly, then it's the only thing. And then we did it, actually, it's part of the work I did with Paolo. Uh, and the result you get is really interesting. You get that the uh, triangle density grows exponentially with the parameter, but has this 1 over n factor, which means that if this alpha is order 1, Asymptotically, there will be no triangles anyway, even if you are biasing towards more triangles. Uh, and an easy fix for this is just basically changing your parameter and making it change with the system size. And now you get this nice, uh, just exponential of your critical density when it becomes uh, one. And this is what we got. So you see the the markers are for n equal to thousand and five thousand. the analytic result, and how do they look? As you would expect, they look uh, kind of trivial, right? It's just, you start with a big ring and small rings, small triangles to start to appear, then if the parameter increases, you get more of these triangles outside until you became more triangles, right? So, we saw this, we say, okay, is what we expect. Uh, the interesting question is like, what will happen in like a non-trivial case, right? And it's really interesting because it looks really similar. Right? And now, uh, so sorry, the image is blocking. This is k q equal three. So this is three regular graphs. So when you start from at the beginning, you get somehow like what you want. You have more loops here than you would typically have in a random three regular graph. But then at some point, the asking for the random graph to have more loops means that you start having these disconnected small things. And you can see that then, like for this ensemble, the, the sort of ground state is just when every node is in a small click and the triangle density here is just a few times bigger than that. So this is somehow like intuitive, but the question is, how fast will I get these clicks, and why? Yeah. Short question. So the first phase is it still pretty like if you take no. into account the triangles or not? Ah. If, you, if you take into account the triangles, it's, it's still going to be a pretty like. 
Yeah, so for low concentration, yeah, you, you expect this to be like some sort of tree of triangles. It's like the kind of people asses, basically, like people asses made of triangles, something like this. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the loops which are made out of the triangles, they don't give you, let's say, all the long time or something like this. What do we know? No, no, here, uh, yeah. The loops made out of, out of triangles. Yeah, I haven't, yeah, probably. And you are, uh, I mean, in, in this slide here, you are still constraining the degrees? Or yeah, the yeah, this is, now it's all regular graphs. Okay, so, but like in the, in the final, let's say, condensate, uh, the degrees are clear, the degree sequence is clearly not, uh, not respected, I assume, because each node has degree three. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is the, so this is the graph. Yeah, so, so degree three. So the, I mean, the constraint on the degrees is no longer satisfied. Yeah, because this is the three regular graph case. Ah, okay, so you're what I'm saying is that degree, you know, okay. yeah. So then it's just like this thing that everyone drew probably, you know, but then for the other degrees you just start seeing these things. But this is the the ground strip it always has this. So then, now the interesting thing is, how does this look as I vary alpha? I think it's all this one. And now let me go quickly through this one, so slowly. <laughs> so these red ones is just like the first time I, I, I just did the run, changing alpha each one. So you see it starts in this like exponential, very similar, and then it starts growing until it reaches faster than I expected this ground state. Uh, so then, so these are the red markers. So then, what I did, I said, okay, I'll just give it more relaxation time, and then I redid exactly the same thing. And this is the purple ones, and you can see that it starts the same, but over here, it goes up. So it is like it was going faster than I expected to the ground state. It was not just a single exponential. This is actually some something like the sum of two exponentials. And, well, this initially baffled me a little bit, but then I realized that this is only because there's like a, a distinction here. Like there are two types of loops, the ones that appear in clicks and the one that appears in like this giant component. That's the one I would be interested in. Uh, so then, I mean, this shouldn't be an equal, this should be, this is more some like some hand-waving argument. And then I said, okay, so this is the probability of finding a loop inside the giant component, and this is in a random regular graph, and this is the probability of one of these clips in a random regular graph, and I just boost them each individually with this exponential, with different coefficients. And this gives me this like double exponential, I mean like this sum of two exponentials. And that's like, it was like just like some sort of naive approximation and I found amazing that it actually gave it to very high accuracy. And what's more interesting about this is that you can see like now there is no way of doing that simple rescaling. If you scale this one to be finite, this will actually also win. And you just this one will diverge. And if you rescale this one to be finite, this one will die out. So there is no way of scaling this in such a way that you have like some sort of giant component in the asymptotic limit with loops inside it. Which for me was like a very interesting result that I did not expect like a, a priori. So what are we seeing here? So for these parameters, uh, this is how the density is growing just by loops appearing inside the giant component. And at some point we switch and now the, the loops are being because clicks are being so what, we're, what I'm trying to say is that after this point, if you want to generate uh, some sort of proxy for a real network, then this becomes useless because real networks are not made of massive number of disconnected clicks. Yeah. Okay. So then, how does this change with time? So this is for two different sizes. So you see, so this is what I would expect originally, but this is with the, this is the probability of the clicks going. So the sum of these two gives you this curve. 
And then for a, a larger size, I get the same thing, just like sort of scale to it. What's uh, interesting is that then I sort of define an upper bound on the maximum number of uh, triangles I can have in my graph before it jumps to the ground state. Uh, so you see as the system grows, what I'm trying to show here is that this bound is actually uh, becoming smaller. Which means that for, for this system size, I could have like, you know, like nice looking loopy graphs up to this density, but here it will be much less. So then I get this sort of, get some sort of, let's see, sort of phase diagram. And I can get it exactly uh, what's the maximum density I can uh, aspire to get at a fixed system size. You see, so for three regular graphs, I can see that for a graph of size a million, I cannot get more than 0.1. Let's say. And of course, as the degree grows, it becomes more. So this is normalized by Q times Q minus one, so they're not directly comparable, it's just so that they are each in the same graph. So, so yeah, so this is a, so then if we go back to this original question, is a, well, it turns out that with this approach for these graphs, we cannot actually generate as much as we want to. So what I did is just basically, I wrote down a formula for this, and yeah, just compare them. You see only these two fall within a range where you can actually generate graphs with this clustering, and then they are not made out of chickens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. Any questions? The relationship would be stable. I mean, instead of doing this uh, maximum entropy, if we were to just generate random graphs by uh, building them out of various shapes like triangles and you know, squares and so on, which is possible, right? Yeah. But uh, kind of sparse on this level. I mean, how, how to say, how is it going to compare this with those measurements of the real from the real graphs? You mean, you mean if you make them like some sort of configuration model for? What we no, it's not a good, let's say it's a, like a random graph, but it's a constructed out of shapes, out of the motifs, which are which are triangles, and so on. But I mean, then I mean it's a very like, naive question. Yeah. In case, I mean, how close we gonna get to those basically measurements of the clustering coefficient? Hmm. No, so I think you could uh... because those random graphs, what we're talking is like about the average range kind. Yeah. But I mean, imagine that there's a unique type, I mean, we want to acquire large hand and doesn't have any loops, I and mean, they're just really like a massive ones, right? They're long ones. But if you put them there by hand, we can start those graphs from the loops. Yeah, so, I mean, like, so what you say, uh, it sounds to me. Four months, four months yeah, it sounds to me similar to. to uh, so there's an approach by Newman, actually. Where instead of saying like how many edges you have in each node, you say like this node has this many edges, and this many triangles around yes, it, yes, and this yes, many yes, you know yes, like you can generalize that easily. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, so definitely you can generate them, and and I mean, and there because you are fixing it to the value you want, they they will match this, right? Yeah. But I think the problem you have there, from what I've read, is that it's the the other properties become less. Uh, like you cannot, like for example, the degree, it, you cannot really control. And there's also this problem that if you fix the triangles, there's actually other triangles formed by the edges that you were thinking were not a part of triangles. So they have like some sort of issues with controlling this type of stuff. And, and then also the final, yeah. Yeah, like I, in a few cases, have I seen them actually calculate something analytically? And, just like for, for a few stuff. The rest is still just also numerical exploration. So, so you can do it. And yeah. yeah, I haven't really looked much more into it. Yeah, okay, so then like, 
what's an alternative? If this is not giving exactly what we want, then uh, the other idea is okay. So maybe here, this is respecting the number of loops that I had asked it. But if I had also told them like higher number of their loops, this would have had more than I expected. Because this has more, let's say eight paths, it has more than what I would have wanted. So the idea is a little bit like, maybe if I specify not only the number of triangles, but of all of them to all orders. Now it's like a crazy idea. So it's like mm -hmm. the first project that I actually started a PhD with. And then it's, okay, so now this will be our setting. We control loops or what? Indirectly through the traces to all orders, and we still keep the degree construct. Uh, so then, okay, you get something very similar. Now you have this sum over all possible loops, and the degree, and the degree you sample from some P of K. And now again, you still go back to this sum that is like, well, I would say impossible to do just naively. Uh, but then we're going to go into some tools from a statistical physics, uh, maybe to replicate the trick, into a possible way uh, to solve this. So this is still just an exploration that I'm sharing with you. Uh, so the idea is what? The, the trace, you can always, because this is a symmetric uh, matrix, you can always write it as the sum of the eigenvalues the power of whatever you put there. And then we introduce this quantity, which is basically the spectral density, which is a, a delta at each eigenvalue. And then these traces I can express as integrals over this density. And then you see I can rearrange these alphas into this some sort of uh, functional parameter that is just an infinite sum. So now this is like the series expansion of some function. And if I plug this in here, I will we get this an alpha for each uh, density of loops. Yeah. So then you get like some sort of a functional order parameter. So now it's like some sort of functional temperature, but you can write the same way as like any other maximum entropy ensemble. But now you have an integral over the spectral density. And now, this actually seems a bit harder. This is uh, a functional, uh, let's say, the free energy. And what you want to impose is that the functional derivative is equal to some spectral density you're interested in observing. And why? Why is this useful? Another way of saying this is because uh, the spectral density of this is just delta Px at the I got the four eigenvalues of these things. While something like this with loops inside the giant component has a continuous spectral density. So I want to impose this non-trivial spectral density on my example, and I will just do it just as we usually do. Uh, okay, so going back again to analytics, like this is not useful if I cannot actually sample. And this is actually more tricky because if you go back to this, you see we, you have to calculate the change in energy but now for this, you have to calculate these functions on each eigenvalue of two n. So, I mean, this becomes computationally very expensive because now this means that for each proposed swap of your Markov chain, you have to diagonalize the whole thing and just basically calculate this. Like, a lot of people have suggested me, you know, like just, because you're only changing one edge, you can just like some sort of approximate the new set of eigenvalues which for one instance, it's fine, but I still do not believe we can like get away with saying that after millions of edge swaps, it's actually the same measure, right? So up to this moment, I think like the only way is just like diagonalizing the whole thing and calculating it. And then how to, tack how to tackle this analytically? Well, this is, it becomes a little bit crazy. Uh, so basically, the configuration model, because the degree, the expected degree is fixed, uh, then they all have the same measure over the ER ensemble. So you do this trick that you swap the sum over graphs with the ER, with an average over the ER graph, which should be the same if this is still being enforced. 
you get something else here that is like the log of these events. And now, uh, we introduce this representation, like the Edward Jones formula for the spectral density. And on top of that, we use this uh, funny complex identity that's uh, set to the i over conjugate set to the i is an exponential of the imaginary particle that we set. So now, okay. So this integral over eigenvalues you approximate it with a sum, and then you get this sort of the same thing, but for this generating function that I specified here. Uh, and then what do you get in the end? You get this very funny limit. So you have, so these sets, they are integrals to a complex power because we're using this previous identity. Right? And they give us what we want, that is what's here. Yeah, go on. So I want the imaginary part of the logarithm of this complex number that's this integral. And I use this identity. I express it as this number to the i over this number conjugate to the i as well. <laughs> but then this is an integral to a complex number. I don't know how to calculate that. So then I do just some crazy trick that might offend some people. <laughs> I just calculate it for an integer number. Mm -hmm. And I do like this integral to infinite to an integer number, it's something I can do, because it's just a multiple integral. Right, so it's something like this. This to a complex number I cannot do. This to a complex, to an, to a, an integer number I can do, I just get the same integral many times. This is a Gaussian integral, which is something I can do. Then what's the goal? Well then after doing the calculation with this, whatever formulas you get, wherever you get this n, you switch it back for this complex number. Uh, and then your uh, functional, your generating functional, that looks something like this. You have to do this, but now this will be something, you see, if you change this to an integral representation, and if you express these integrals in a Gaussian form, you will get something that you will actually be able to somehow uh, transform into a saddle point integral. So the story is not that easy because I mean this this was done already by Tonkulian when I started PhD and it turns out it's just been two years of fighting with this and it's still not clear what will come out of it but some interesting stuff has come out. Uh, okay. Maybe just here. So I'm just going to skip to the calculations. Uh, but anyway, the original thing for the two regular graphs did manage to come out of this replica here. Okay, so then just quickly some conclusions. Uh, yeah, so traditional maximum entropy random graphs do not present the cluster and we want from real networks. Uh, even if we include degree correlations or the, or the degree distribution. Uh, then if you have a maximum entropy approach with degree constraint, this gives you a theory where you can control loops, but you can actually, you cannot do it in, a, in such a way that you have like a, an asymptotic limit that's well defined as you would want in statistical physics. Uh, but still you can get some sort of controllable finite size theory, but it has this problem that you're not free to do whatever you want, basically. And well, just presented like what could lead to a more general approach, controlling the full spectral density, which still has many unknowns. And yeah, so basically that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I also got uh, thanks to Tom Kuhlen, Paolo, and our other collaborator Matilde, and also Tom Kuhlen sends his regards to Dr. Kuhlen. <laughs> <laughs> that's very nice. <laughs> So we're just trying Any to. Questions? Yeah, so I guess I can understand why you were first looking at 